Are we live? We are live. It's a couple seconds. It's like a thirty second delay. But this right here, right? Because it's red, it probably yeah. not live yet. But maybe we, maybe this actually will it's, be live. It's wrong. It's it's gonna take thirty seconds to. Oh, okay. So it's just thirty seconds. Yeah, it's a little it's delay. Working, it says. Cool. We'll wait till it comes up on his. But I'm curious if it's gonna be thirty seconds ago or if it's gonna be now. No, it's gonna be thirty seconds ago. <laughs> Can you hear us okay? Yep. Awesome. Concerned about this. But uh <laughs> But we got those. <laughs> yeah. Great. All right, you can hear us well. Awesome. You good, Michael? Mm -hmm. Great. Well, let's go ahead and get started then. <laughs> awesome. The the joys of live. All right, well, thanks everybody This for coming out today. This is our live pilot episode of Femgineer TV. And before we get into the topic today, just wanna to take a moment uh, to introduce myself. I'm your host, Pornima Vijay Shankar. I'm also the founder of Femgineer. And for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, Femgineer is an education company. And our goal is to help innovators build tech products that will give them freedom in their careers, enrich other people's lives and make the entire tech community a lot more inclusive uh, as well as flexible. So before we get started, just a couple of housekeeping items. Um, the first is, like I said before, we're doing this live. So if you wanna participate in the discussion, hop on over to Twitter, use the hashtag FemGineerTV and feel free to start chatting away. If you have any questions, go ahead and post them using the same hashtag, FemGineerTV. And towards the end, we will take uh, questions from the live audience. And then if there's anything else, feel free to chat with us online and uh, feel free to email us as well. All right, so with that, let's go ahead and jump into today's topic. Um, so the topic for today is how to build a happy and productive remote team. And the reason I chose this topic is because it's something that's you know really important for all of us as uh, tech professionals uh, and also as people who are maybe startupers building a company. There always comes a time where you find that amazing employee and it just so happens that they don't live in your location or maybe you decide that you want to start the business in a new city and you want to start recruiting people who are local. So when that happens, you've got to decide how are you going to build an in-house team and scale that and make sure that they get along with your existing team. So that's the topic for today. And uh, for those of you who wrote in and asked some questions around how do we outsource, how do we hire remote teams, we're going to defer that for probably a future episode. Um, but today we're going to focus on in-house teams. And I've invited my good friend, Ben Congleton, who is a CEO and founder of Olark. Thanks for joining us, Ben. Yeah, thanks for Nima. Yeah, and uh, I invited Ben because for the last eight years now, is that how old Olark is? Uh, I think it's, that's a little bit strange. Seven years. Seven About years. seven years, yeah. Okay, so for the last seven years, Ol uh, Ben's been building Olark. He's bootstrapped the business. It's now a multi-million dollar profitable business, and his team is a little over 30 people. Yeah, we're just over 30 right now. Yeah, and they span SF all the way to Europe. Uh, and the reason I brought Ben on board is because First, like he built the entire team together. They all lived in one house for the first few years. And then over time, they started to make a remote team uh, and started to scale their remote culture. So I thought Ben would be a great person to learn from today. So before we dig into the topic, Ben, why don't you tell us about what Olark is and what you guys do? Yeah, absolutely. So Olark is that little chat box that you keep seeing in the bottom right-hand corner of a website. Basically, what we do is we let you uh, talk to your customers when they're on your website so that you can close more sales, provide better support, and get great customer feedback. So lots of startups use us, lots of uh, SaaS companies, a lot of uh, retailers online, uh, thousands of companies are using Olark to connect better with their customers and uh, you know build successful businesses. Awesome. And, you're, and your customers are all over the place too, right? They're Pretty yeah. much in like Brazil, they're in Europe, they're in Asia. Yeah, absolutely. We have customers all around the world. Uh, most of our customers are in uh, the US, but we do have customers in Australia, in Asia, India, uh, Europe. Um, yeah, we're very uh, international. Any Anyone can chat, can benefit from chatting with their customers. So it works out pretty well. Awesome. So 
Let's talk about the, the remote teams now, uh, the topic at hand. What I've always found really strange is that as uh, technology companies, you know, we, we want to build products that are going to help us share, connect, and collaborate with other folks, whether they're friends and family. But there are a lot of technology companies out there that despite the products they build, have a real aversion to having remote teams. And some leaders will even go so far as to abolish any sort of remote cultures. I'm not gonna name any names here. Uh, it happens both in large scale as well as smaller companies. But what I've noticed with Olark is that you guys have embraced remote mm -hmm. and it's actually helped your business and has benefited it. So can you explain maybe a couple reasons how it's benefited Olark? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, one of the big things that remote has helped us with is hiring. So uh, we have the ability to hire anywhere in the world. Uh, mostly we focus right now on US time zones, but we can hire the best candidate that we can find regardless of where they live. And we can give them flexibility, right? So they can, uh, you know, work strange hours uh, or the sort of make Olark really fit into their lifestyle. Uh, we also uh, are where our customers are. Like Courtney said before, our customers are all around the world and so are our employees. So, uh, you know, members of the Olark team can help us organize meetups in New York City or in Austin or in Toronto. It allows us to sort of have this global presence even when we are a relatively small company. Uh, and a local presence. Yeah, actually, yeah, a local presence in many locations. Yeah. That's true. That's true. And then uh, finally, uh, the one other benefit that we get from this is we get to be, uh, we're sort of forced to be really good at communication. So like Pornima was saying, a lot of these companies are focused on building tools that help them communicate. Uh, well, when you're building a remote team, you need to be very good at communication and in particular written communication. So Olark is a chat company. Uh, we help people type back and forth with each other. Uh, so we do this all the time within our company, and which helps us really think critically about the tools that we're building and how we can help people communicate better. Awesome. So even though you're now a remote team, you and your other three co-founders all started by living in the same house. Mm. Uh, and even at, at one point in time, some of your wives lived with you, <laughs> right? So I know that was probably like a really critical time. How do you mm. think that living in the same house or just you know, maybe not living, but being in the same location helped you build your team? Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. I think that, uh, well, to give a little bit of backstory, we all started off in this, uh, we went through Y Combinator in 2009. And when we moved out to California, uh, we got $25,000 from uh, Y Combinator. Uh, now they're giving a lot more, but back then it was just that amount of money. And $25,000 does not go very far in Silicon Valley. So we wanted to stretch that money out as much as possible. And so what we did is we found the cheapest place where we could all live that was close to Y Combinator. So we ended up having a guy sleeping in the dining room. Uh, everyone just had mattresses on the floor. It was pretty, uh, pretty uh, intense, right? Because our only living area was an office and, and people would just go upstairs if they wanted to crash. So we had this very... Uh, intense co-located experience with the team. And what I think that helped us do is have to work, uh, it sort of forced us to learn how to resolve conflict and work through conflict and sort of understand uh, how conflict works uh, like very, very well. So having the co-founders go through this experience where we're all living together uh, dealing with each other every day. And there really was no escape. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if it's healthy or not, but there was no escape. And so we, had to work through all these communication issues, understand that we had different styles of communicating, understand that we had different sort of desires for the company. And I think getting that awareness really early on in this uh, sort of intense environment helped us be very mindful of conflict and how we scale communication. Mm -hmm. Now we think about communication as we sort of built the company out. Got it. Yeah, that's, uh, that's interesting. How did your how did your wives feel about living <laughs> together? Well, only only my wife oh, okay. uh, lived in, lived with us for yeah. a while, and Cat Cat is awesome. So Cat uh, really enjoyed it. You know, for her, when we we're just uh, like a smaller team, she felt like uh, she was part of the Olark team in some regards. Like she just knew everyone on the team. Mm -hmm. It was like one big happy family. Uh, as we've grown, she's become a little bit more disconnected, and it feels strange to her. But uh, 
you know, back at the beginning, I think it, it helps to have that really strong common bond uh, with people and know that, you know, you can go through uh, bad times and good times and you're just, you know, you're there for each other. I think that's really important. Awesome. So then there came a point in time where your co-founder, one of your co-founders mm -hmm. decided that he wanted to move back to Michigan. Yeah. And that probably brought up some concerns for you, right? I know one of the major misconceptions that we want to start tackling today is that when, whenever there's a transition to remote, uh, leaders feel like employees are just not going to be productive and that progress is going to stagnate. And I always find it funny because I think those leaders are the ones who oftentimes lead through fear and threats rather than trust and influence. And a lot of times they think, oh my gosh, if there's just like a warm body in a cubicle, they're getting work done. They're writing code. I hear tapping going on. Uh, but if they're somewhere else, we don't know. And chances are, if they're working from home, they're probably working on other projects. So I'm sure you might have had maybe an inkling of some of this. How did you build up some systems of accountability? Mm -hmm. How did you put trust in your employees as you made that transition? Well, the interesting thing about uh, this particular case, when we're talking about Zach leaving, is Zach was a co-founder. And so we had this very strong bond. We lived together. And so we weren't really as worried about him, you know, not contributing mm -hmm. when he moved back to Michigan. But, uh, you know, in the broader scheme of things, like now we have 30 employees, we're spread out all around the world. You can't check in if everyone every day. Uh, so I think uh, part of part of what we do is we've put a lot of effort into building a very strong culture so that people feel connected to our mission and really want to help customers. And so, uh, you know, one way that we do that at Olark is everyone on the team goes through customer service training. So everyone uh, has a shared experience of being customer service, understanding our product, talking directly to our customers. Uh, and you know, working with people they wouldn't normally work with, which also sort of prevents a little bit of uh, a little bit of siloing. Uh, the other thing that we do is we try to you know add accountability. So you're accountable to your team, like the people that you're working with on sort of a day to day basis. Mm -hmm. uh, often teams will uh, project teams will meet, you know, have a brief scrum in the morning and just sync up. Uh, you're accountable to the organization through uh, a weekly team sync where. Uh, project leads give like a very brief, like one sentence update about what they're working on. Uh, and then uh, we also use some task tracking software that lets us um, kind of keep track of the work that's being done, uh, seeing if tasks are dragging. So Matt built this really cool internal tool that we use called Pancake mm -hmm. that lets us see uh, basically all the tasks that anyone inside Olark is working on and then how long this task has been going on. And so really what we're trying to do is figure out how to unblock people that are stuck on things. We're not trying to say like, oh, this is taking you way too long. It's more like, oh, uh, most people finish tasks on a pretty regular basis. If yeah. something is stuck, what's going on? How can we work to sort that problem out? Nice. So you're giving them the benefit of the doubt. You're not like, why is this bug taking you 10 hours to fix? It'll only take me two. But mm -hmm. instead you're saying like, hey, if it's taking you 10 hours, maybe you're stuck. Mm -hmm. How can I help? Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, we sort of have changed our core values over time. We started off, we had uh, core values that had the acronym CAMPS, and then we added the CHAMPS. So this, the H was help each other. And so I think uh, for us uh, realizing that it's our, that we need to be out there helping each other uh, solve problems and working together as a team, it's not kind of like your responsibility to sort this out. And if you can't do it on your own, then it's your problem. It's really, uh, you know, if we see someone flailing, we need to get out there and understand, uh, you know, why they're flailing, how we can train them, how we can help them accomplish what they're doing. And at the same time, you're trying to train people that when they are having problems to reach out for help. And I think that uh, in a remote culture in particular, that's really important because you can't just walk around the room and see people that are frustrated. You need to get people in the mindset that when they're running into a problem, they need to talk to someone else and just you know, let them know like, hey, you know, I'm having some trouble here. Uh, and oftentimes just a really quick Skype call or a really quick conversation can sort all this out. And, nice. uh, you know, again, I get I go back to communication a lot because I think that, you know, whether you're physically located in one location and everyone's in the same office or if you're remote, communication really is 
you know, it's where you're going to run into the most problems. Yeah, which is actually the second, I think, a misconception that we want to tackle today, that communication will break down. And you brought up an interesting point that when you're sitting next to each other, you can at least see the person that, that's distressed. And, you know, if you're at least somewhat empathetic, you might be like, hey, what's, <laughs> what's going on? Um, but I've actually uh, noticed teams where people will sit right next to each other and either not care or they won't even know what the person is working on, mm -hmm. uh, even though they might be on the same team or maybe they're in different departments, but literally they like sit right next to each other. Um, so we know distance isn't a culprit. And a lot of times the issues are people who sometimes are just afraid to speak up mm -hmm. because they think they're going to get shot down or they're the new kid in town. So they don't want to ruffle any feathers. Um, and another is uh, people feel like there's too many channels. They're on maybe something like a chat channel, you've got email, and then on top of that, sometimes people SMS each other. So they get flooded to the point where they're like, I don't want to talk to anybody. Mm -hmm. um, a third issue is people feel like, wow, there's a really short leash and I've always got to respond. I don't want to always have to respond to every little email or fire that comes my way. Um, and then the fourth thing you talked about is silos happening across departments. Mm -hmm. um, let's, let's start with the first, like this fear of uh, speaking up. Mm -hmm. How have you dealt with it, especially with new employees now that you are a bigger team? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. I think you know part of this is something you hire for a little bit. You do look for people that are willing to speak their mind. Mm -hmm. And so in your interview process, you look at that. Uh, I can go back to our core values. So one of our core values very early on was speak your mind. And so uh, we uh, strongly encourage Olarkers to talk about what they're thinking. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, again, in a remote culture, we're not going to be able to poll as well. We need people who are gonna stand up and tell us what's going on. Uh, so uh, doing that and also uh, making it safe for people to talk nice. about yeah. various topics. I think that uh, another one of our core values, again, a lot of this, I think, to me, goes back to culture. So yeah. another one of our core values is assume good faith and, to pr and another one is practice empathy. So we, we try to ingrain into our culture um, that, you know, one, if there's something you want to talk about, you should talk about it. You shouldn't feel bad. You shouldn't feel judged. Uh, also that it's on the listener mm -hmm. to practice empathy and really try to understand what someone is saying. And then finally, mm -hmm. if you're, you know, having doubts about the motivation behind something that was said, assuming good faith is a really good way of sort of, uh, framing things in your mind. So for example, if I go up and there's a new release and I'm like, this release sucks, like, uh, you know, that we, we can't launch this as, as going on. Like some people may take that as a personal attack. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, and part of it might mean that like, maybe Ben didn't get a lot of sleep last night. Maybe something else is going on. Assume good faith. Assume that Ben is, you know, really thinking of the company, thinking of like uh, the product, thinking of the customers and try to like practice empathy and understand why Ben is feeling this way uh, and understand that Ben is speaking his mind. And it's not just, uh, he's not trying to hurt someone. Yeah. He's not trying to like call anyone out. He's just really trying to express what he's feeling. And so by making it safe for people to communicate with each other, I think that uh, you can alleviate a lot of these problems that often happen where people feel judged if someone else calls them out on something or, uh, or you know, is afraid to speak at all. Uh, nice. But again, you know, I think this takes work. This is an ongoing challenge yeah. that you have to meet. And as you scale, the processes change as well. Totally. Uh, let's tackle the fourth as well, silos. I know you talked about this a little bit, um, and I know that at Olark you said everybody mans chat, so mm -hmm. that means everybody has to do customer support at mm -hmm. some point in time, whether they're an engineer or they're marketing or they actually are customer support. Yeah, sure. And so maybe you can touch upon how that's really helped prevent silos from forming. Yeah, that's interesting. I think uh, one, one tool that you can use in a remote company is having something that everyone does uh, at Olark, everyone does customer service because we care very much about you know building tools that help people talk to their customers, and we want to be really good at you know training people to talk to their customers, understanding the challenges when you bring new people on, uh, and make everyone very passionate about the product. So for us, customer service is one way of getting everyone in the team to have the shared experience. Everyone goes through training. Everyone uh, has a rotation right now. It's on a biweekly basis where they're actually on the front lines talking directly to customers using our product, which means they'll you know, see all the recent product enhancements that they will 
uh, understand the questions that customers are asking, and really it'll uh, give them some insight into why people use Alark in the first place uh, as they go about their day-to-day -day jobs, which I think are, are all very, very important. Uh, yeah, that's things. cool. Now, some people might be like, oh, I've got to do that on top of fixing bugs or doing my marketing plan. Yeah. Like, that seems like a lot to do. So do you guys carve out time, or how do you balance the work? That, that's a very good point. I think it is, it is from a straight up capitalist perspective, it's very expensive to have, you know, uh, you know, very, you know, high paid engineers do customer service. And so for us, you know, this is, it's always a challenge, right? The cost of doing this. Um, uh, the way we do it at Olark, the way we solve this problem is uh, Kat, who is on the customer service team, basically does a schedule. And everyone on the team has a block of time that is scheduled on a biweekly basis where they know they're going to be on chat. And everyone else knows that they're going to be on chat during that period, too. Uh, so having a very like solid set schedule is important. And then also uh, we have a, uh, a board, like sort of like a ride board where you can trade off shifts. So if you're going on vacation nice. or, uh, you know, if maybe you're doing a TV show in the morning <laughs> or something, you can put up a. Uh, you know, your shift there and switch it with someone else. Okay. Uh, and so, you know, making it flexible, making it easy to switch shifts, uh, you know, is really important. And, you know, we're honestly, we're always looking at ways to improve this process. And we're uh, currently, we even have an inter uh, a project that's about to kick off where we're thinking about, well, let's think about, you know, the next version of All Hands Apart. Let's figure out how we can make it better. How can we uh, help our teammates get more out of it? But the one thing we're not giving up is having everyone on the team have the shared experience because I cool. think it's it's very valuable. Yeah. So let's tackle the third and probably uh, most heated misconception, which is if you have a remote team, it's going to be totally devoid of culture. Everyone's going to be doing their own thing. Mm -hmm. They're not going to talk to each other. They're not going to know like what the other person's favorite, I don't know, candy bar is <laughs> or like the kids, <laughs> their kids' names. And you can only get that if you are, you know, definitely in the same location. Um, but as you mentioned, it's it's not always about that. It's about defining and hiring the right fit. So how do you communicate the criteria for your culture mm -hmm. to your other employees during the hiring process? Well, one thing that I'd like to point out is just we sort of live in this world where uh, a lot of our communication and interaction with others is digital. Like if you if you look at Facebook and how much time people spend on Facebook, yeah, a lot of that is not in person interaction. So we're at like currently in the world, a lot of people are in, engaging with each other in a non-physical thing. So, so I think we have that going for us. It's a lot easier to engage socially without physically being next to each other than it used to be. Uh, but we do a lot inside of our uh, culture to help, uh, first of all, hire the right people that are excited about not just, say, writing code all day, but really want to help build a company. And so what I mean by this is we have great aspects of our culture that, you know, as founders, we didn't think of doing this. Like it just sort of organically happened. And one, and uh, there's a few uh, neat, neat anecdotes from Olark. So uh, one Olarker that we hired decided that he was going to become the Olark gnome. And, uh, and basically whenever anyone has an Olark adversary, right? When people like are one year in, yeah. uh, the Olark gnome will anonymously send someone a present. Nice. That's that's really cool. And you know, it wasn't something we started. Yeah. It was just like, you know, this person had this idea and we're like, hey, go run with this. Uh, we also have uh, uh, weekly show and tells that happened when, you know, one Olarker was like, hey, uh, I'd really like for us to have more talks and talk about stuff. And he just started organizing that event. And now, uh, you know, people are giving talks about uh, something they're passionate about. Um, you know, on a weekly basis. And from that, we actually did a Ignite, like an Olark Ignite at our in-person retreat, totally organized just by Nick, because he thought like, hey, I'd love to do Ignite. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had a ton of really, really great talks at our retreat. And so a lot of this is, you know, hiring people that We're care about that. people. Yeah. Yeah. And so one uh, one interesting aspect of our culture is because we're interviewing people who want to do customer service as part of their job. Like they know that mm -hmm. like when they're hired, you tend to get people who care about people or are a little bit more empathetic. And so, uh, you know, I, I think it has some like interesting side effects. Uh, there's a few other things we do in our culture that are that are kind of interesting. Uh, we uh, have this annual retreat 
And so for me, the annual retreat is sort of like trying to cram in all that hang out with coworkers into like one crazy week. Yeah. So we, how do people feel about the retreat? <laughs> I, uh, that's a really good question. Like on average, I think everyone's pretty excited about it, but I don't know survey results off the top of my okay. head. Generally, I think everyone has a really good time. So yeah. what we end up doing is we fly everyone and their, uh, their significant others out to some location. And we think bringing significant others is very important mm -hmm. because, uh, you know, we want, we want Olark to sort of be part of people's, Olark is very much part of someone's life. And when you're building a remote culture, your you know, significant others never really meet any of your coworkers or any of their coworker spouses. Yeah. And so we really want to facilitate those types of relationships as well, because uh, you know, it can be kind of lonely working from home. Uh, and through like facilitating those types of interactions, we've had, you know, remote teams go on ski trips together, cool. like as, you know, like bringing their wives or significant others, which is, which is awesome, right? To have these sort of remote impromptu interactions that might happen in a physical workplace, but facilitated uh, remotely. Uh, we also try to make it really easy for remote coworkers to uh, work together in a location. So for example, Olark will pay for the airfare if you fly, if you spend a week in any location. So for example, uh, you know, some of our San Francisco old workers flew out to Ann Arbor to uh, work with the Ann Arbor team and they hung out there for a week, had a lot of fun and Olark covered the, covered the flight. And we try to do that whenever, whenever someone wants to go, um, you know, meet up with another Olarker. Yeah. Cause you know, in person is still important. Right. You know, that's, that's really generous of you guys to do that. So, so what do you do if you, you know, find somebody, a candidate, or you bring on an employee and they just don't fit. I mean, you let them go. Right? Let them if go. it yeah. doesn't fit, they're yeah. gone. Uh, and you know, how do you screen for that early? Yeah, on? No, that's true. Uh, I mean, so one example was we had this candidate we loved who was who was amazing, and uh, for this candidate, we decided to do a contract to hire, which is something that you know people talk about fairly often out here. We actually decided not to do that anymore, but okay. in this particular case, we said, "Hey, come contract us." Uh, for a month, uh, we'll do two weeks in person and two weeks remote. And so in person, this person was amazing. They were awesome. They were really like driven. They got a lot done. When they were remote, they just weren't engaged. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, mutually we decided like, hey, this isn't really working. You probably need some, you probably need something that's a little bit more in person. Uh, so one thing to keep in mind is remote is certainly not for everyone. Yeah. I think that uh, you really need uh, sort of a, a support structure to support it. Like uh, a lot of our remote employees have started going to co-working spaces because they found out that they weren't really getting any human interaction uh, when they were working from home. That works for some people. It doesn't work for everyone. So uh, it's, there are many challenges of, you know, keeping your remote teams like healthy and happy. And for us, uh, we, you know, we invest a lot in our employees. So we are not doing remote to cut cost. So uh, for us, uh, you know, if someone needs a co-working space, mm -hmm. if someone wants to go to a conference, if someone needs a flight to an office to go collaborate on something, that's, you know, that's all part of what we budget into our hires. Uh, and, you know, just, just really being supportive of your team, I think is very important. That's awesome. Well, I've got one last question for you, Ben, and then we'll jump to Q&A. Uh, so time zones. Uh-huh. I know that you know we try our best to work remotely. We try to have the best communication channel, but sometimes it's really, really hard, especially with folks who might be 17 hours ahead, like some folks in Australia. It's not, it's not your fault, it's not our fault, but a lot of times that can make it difficult to get mm -hmm. synced up. Mm -hmm. How have you, one, benefited, but also has there been any sort of struggle in mm -hmm. dealing with time zones? To be perfectly honest, we avoid time zone issues. Okay. We, like, yeah. we are afraid of time yeah. zone issues. Uh, we do have uh, Rhoda, who's in the uh, in this, on this little island in Scotland. Uh -huh. And uh, she has a, a weird uh, work schedule where she'll work in the morning, like uh, work at Olark in her morning. And then she'll kind of go off and uh, I think she's doing basically farming. Oh, so wow. she'll go off and, yeah. and you feed, know, the feed the chickens and uh, she's doing a lot of home renovation stuff like that during the day while uh -huh. it's light out. And then at night she'll come back and she'll work some more. So basically in that case, uh, she, because she likes staying up late, this mm -hmm. works out well. Okay. And so she's able to sort of be online during a time where we can meet up and she can attend our team meetings and our show and tells and stuff like that. But I will admit that that is hard. Yeah. And Rhoda is the only person in that situation. Everyone else uh, inside Olark 
is within uh, four hours of PST. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I feel like if you're within four hours of the of PST, uh, you're probably fine. So we mostly try to hire a remote like up and down the uh, equator. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, not yeah, <laughs> like the <laughs> whatever hemisphere we have. Yeah, yeah. Trying to <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Great. Well, thank you, Ben. Um, I want to take some questions now from the audience. So for those of you who have a question out there, feel free to jump on onto Twitter. Um, use the hashtag FemGineerTV and go ahead and enter your question. I'm going to go ahead and take the first question from the audience. Um, so the first question is, we use Slack to manage our remote team. What tools do you recommend? Um, so yeah, Slack is, Slack is great for communicating, especially on dev teams. Ben, do you have any recommendations for tools that you guys use? I know you said you built an in-house tool called Pancake, but yeah. do you use any? Yeah, so we use uh, we use a bunch. Uh, we uh, we use HipChat. Mm -hmm. I think Slack is getting a lot of popularity nowadays. It's probably worth evaluating. Uh, having a good video chat solution is also pretty mm -hmm. good. Uh, we've sort of toyed with Skype. We've messed around with this tool called Fuse. I don't I don't think we have a great recommendation there uh, for task tracking. We have gone through every tool you can think of. <laughs> yeah. uh, we've used Pivotal Tracker. We've used Jira. We've used Trello. Uh, I think the key thing to remember is all those tools have like their pluses and minuses. And it's actually what we found is once you sort of decide on a tool and we're like, we are going to make this tool work and not have discussions about tooling all the time, uh, I think it'll it'll do wonders for you because there's no there's no perfect tool to yeah. use. Well, I think the other is that a lot of times people mm -hmm. get too um, reliant on their tools. Like they think the tool is going to do all the work for them, but the tool is only as good as you use it. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times the tools come with best practices. So mm -hmm. I know at Tracker, for example, you know it's not going to predict how long it's going to take you to do a task. Like you've got to figure that out. But the more often you enter in and the better you get at estimating, then then it's going to be more predictive. So mm -hmm. I think that's important for people. I have one actually final tool recommendation yeah. that I don't hear talked about enough. So I feel like we should blog yeah, about yeah. it. Is we are heavy, heavy Google Docs users. Okay. And the thing that yep, is awesome same. about Google Docs is you can have 30 people in the same document. So when we have, uh, say, a team sync on Mondays, you have 30 people in this document and they're able to add agenda items as they want. Uh, we have this whole kudos section where people thank each other for what they did last week, which is all sort of dynamically entered into the mm -hmm. meeting. So uh, agendas, I think, are very important if you're going to have remote meetings. And we found Google Docs to be very helpful for us. Awesome. Yeah, I think I think they, they do a good job of collaborating on that. I know my editor and I use Google Doc as well. Cool. We're going to go on to our second question. Uh, let's see this one. How do you handle Scrum standups with remote teams? Or does Scrum even work in this case? Uh, well, at least, at least with our team, uh, we you can do five minute Skype standup. Uh, I don't I don't really see a big concern. Actually, some of our teams do that. Some of our project teams decide that they want to do five minute standups in the morning. It seems to work fine. I think the key thing is a time zone issue, right? Because we're not uh, spanning, we don't have anyone who's 10 hours off mm -hmm. working on a scrum team that we don't have like this async problem. We also do uh, sort of a daily scrum and maybe not the exact, not following scrum entirely, but a lot of times uh, inside of HipChat, we have a, a bot that uh, when you, you could just type like hashtag scrum and then what you're working on, cool. we'll keep track of that and you can go in and see what everyone else been, has been up to. Yeah, that's great. I think asynchronous communication with uh, with my startup, BusyBee, we always try to emphasize that because developers would get in the zone and the last thing they wanted was to like step away from that and do scrum. Mm -hmm. So instead, just having asynchronous communication, like jumping into a chat channel, saying what they're working on, and then you know they'll come back a few hours later, but not having to sync up all the time is important so that people can stay productive. All right, next question. Uh, what tools do you use for source control with remote teams? Uh, sure. So we, I mean, we use GitHub. I, I'm not, I, we haven't done a lot of evaluation, but I can tell you when we switched to GitHub, it completely changed the way that we did uh, remote collaboration uh, for source control. And part of the reason was it had really good built-in code review tools. Yeah. And so uh, I think that very early on when we were four people, I was personally very resistant to doing code review because it was just so kludgy. But uh, as uh, once we adopted GitHub, we immediately started doing 
code review. And now we have very, very good code review and good practices around code review. And, and I think the nice thing about something like GitHub is it's really easy to do asynchronous code review. So you can put up a pull request, people can go through line by line comment. If there's a lot of confusion, you can do like a quick Skype call or you know maybe chat back and forth in hip chat. And then finally, before anything gets shipped out, uh, someone has to sort of give it a ship and the person who gives it the ship sort of takes on responsibility like, hey, uh, you know, uh, this is good enough to go out. Nice. Actually, yeah, I've got a follow-up question to that. So how do you then uh, manage all the pull requests, like make sure that they don't pile up? Because I know that's oftentimes an issue for people are like, hey, I've been waiting on my pull requests so that I can mark this bug as fixed. Well, I, I think uh, typically what you do, if, if you have a pull request and someone is not reviewing it, uh, you go bug other people okay. on yeah, chat so you do a until, little, yeah. until they review it. Uh, nice. Alternatively, uh, in our engineering meeting, uh, I don't think we current we don't have a bot or anything, but a lot of times we'll list the number of open pull requests, mm -hmm. and we also have this concept of ship it Thursday, where we really uh, encourage everyone to get their pull request shipped. Oh, okay. Uh, I know that Brandon, for example, at one of his startups he used to be at, uh, they uh, they would like have a set number of pull requests that could be open at once. So like before you open a new pull request, help someone finish off uh, their pull request. So I think a lot of this is just discipline, having people in the organization. I think uh, Zach has taken on a lot of uh, responsibility of just making sure people either ship or close their pull requests. And so uh, yeah, I think that's a good organizational process. Yeah, now. I think that's a good kind of golden rule policy, like yeah. do do other people's pull requests as you would want them to do. Yeah, it. yeah exactly. And another like quick quick yeah. point is that uh, tools are great. Process is what makes tools mm, work that's and a good scale. Point. Yep. And so understanding that you know it's it, it, no tool is a magic bullet, like you were saying. Yep. And uh, we end up spending a lot of time developing process to help us work better. And originally when we were like four people, I was against all process, but now we're 30 people. I'm like, wow. Uh, process is amazing. Oh, and yeah. uh, you, the key thing to think about is when you adopt process, just make it uh, malleable. Right. But be willing right. to give it enough time to know whether it works or not. Because a lot of times it takes a while to work out all the kinks in a process. So if something didn't work for one week or two weeks or a month, but you see the light at the end of the tunnel, like kind of stick with it. A lot of times people will adopt the process fail at it for a few weeks and try to adopt a new process, you never find the right thing. Right. Yeah, we actually had a, at BusyBee, uh, Alex, my co-founder, and I, We uh, when we first started using Tracker, it took me a while to get used to the process. Like, he he got it, but for some reason, I was just kind of struggling with it. So I instituted this policy of having postmortems at the end of every release, and then having everybody sit down and being, hey, this is what we love about the process, this is what we hate, how can we fix it? But we'd only make one improvement. So we didn't try to jam in everything. We weren't, we weren't like, here's my list of 10 complaints, now let's fix them all. It was just like, pick one complaint and let's focus on that. Um, but I think it really helped. And it got us to a point where we were shipping consistently. And like you said, kind of doing that Thursday shipping as well. Mm -hmm. So I think, yeah, definitely process is important. Awesome. Well, thank you, Ben, for joining us today. I think uh, this was a great pilot episode. So I appreciate you coming out, sharing OLARC teaching us about your remote culture and hopefully the audience has definitely learned and will start to use or maybe implement some of your strategies as they grow their teams. Um, I also want to just do a quick recap. So we talked about sort of three misconceptions today. The first one that we talked about was how your employees aren't going to be productive and progress is going to stagnate. And I think Ben's done a great job of showing how you could keep making progress, but a lot of it is keeping the communication channels clear, finding the people that are really invested in your product and your company. Um, and then the second uh, misconception we talked about is as we decide to make the transition from maybe being a pure local in-house team to a remote team, um, you might feel like communication is going to break down. So how do you keep the lines open? And I really like that concept of having the one shared experience that everyone's got to do because it forces them to kind of get together. And for Olark, it's everyone's got a man chat. Um, the third being devoid of culture. So I think we've touched upon that, just being really clear, setting out your values, making sure everybody on the team understands that, and also gauging the fit as you hire new people, and then having some fun things like doing retreats, having maybe gnomes, uh, or, or whatever you know, whatever quirky things people in your company want to do. But 
creating a safe zone in which people can express themselves and add to the culture. Um, I think we're all still a little bit skeptical about time zones, so I'm curious to see if anybody in the audience has uh, a solution for that. Um, but I think this was, this was great, so thanks for coming out. I also want to take a moment to thank all of you for tuning in today. I hope you enjoy this episode. We will be doing the next episode uh, in March, and our guest will be Jocelyn Goldfein, who is the former director at Facebook. Um, so we'll have her on the show. And then last but not least, I want to thank our amazing sponsors, Pivotal Tracker, for helping us with this pilot episode. They've given us space. They've helped put this all together. So thank you to Ronan and his amazing team. Thank you, Theron, for fielding all the questions today. Awesome. So we'll look forward to seeing you all in March. Until then, have a good day. Excellent. See ya.